Uh, why I'm here is because I came primarily to find out how my organization, Bomb Techs Without Borders, and myself personally, could aid in the effort to to recover and destroy unexploded ordnance um, in Ukraine. As it turned out, the National Police EOD is here, and of course, uh, there's was quite a bit of action on the north side of Kiev um, at the beginning of the war, and so uh, although I wasn't necessarily expecting to do it that early, I was certainly came prepared to do it that early. We were actually out picking up ordnance on Thursday. Wow. So we were we were working with the National Police EOD team. They were out there with their technicians, and they kind of took us to 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 to, I guess, just sort of observe their operate. I had asked to go and observe their operations, and and uh, my colleague Dakota and I, um, he's a ten year Air Force EOD tech, so he's uh, much more recent than I am in terms of his T- EOD expertise. But both of us are familiar with how to act in front of uh, unexploded ordnance. And so we just went out there and got to work. And I think that pleased them a lot uh, that we weren't there just to look and, you know, take pictures. We weren't, we weren't tourists. We were there to do work. And so we did, we, we picked up a lot of shells and stuff and moved them. And uh, we took some fuses out. Uh, We uncovered a few things and, and uh, um, you know, we did our part. The task force Yankee guys are really not focused on any one organization here in uh, the Ukraine. They're focused on supporting whatever works, you know, whatever, if you're a medic, they've got medical organizations they'll tag you into. If you're an infantryman, they'll try to hook you up with a legion or territorial defense, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was initially through them. And again, I was reaching out to several other uh, things and I, I, I ran into a page called Friends of Ukraine EOD. Now that's a British based outfit. Um, and I reached out to them and I said, do you have an American POC? And they handed me a guy in BTWAB. And so I ended up talking to the guys in uh, Bomb Techs Without Borders. And I sent them uh, all of my bona fides. I, th- I sent them a resume. I sent them about a one-page sort of summary of what the resume says, plus some things that are not in the resume. And I sent them my officer record brief and a copy of my DD-214 so they could see that I was for real. And... They, they came back to me pretty quickly and said, hey, if you are willing to, to basically state that you're not there to conduct kinetic operations, you're not there to do non-humanitarian stuff, you're, you're not there to shoot Russians, you're there to save lives. If you'll make that commit, commitment to us, we'd like to hire you. And uh, Now, hire me with no pay, but hire me. And so I'm officially a member of B12.org and um, you know, have a B12 email address. And uh, and I am the country coordinator for Ukraine for for bomb techs without borders. Wow. And so how you mentioned the qualifications, how does your military background prepare you for what you're doing in Ukraine? Well, um, I was uh, an explosive ordnance disposal tech, but I also graduated that course in 1973. So a day or two ago and uh, the army sent me back to EOD. I, I spent most of my career in special forces. Um, and then the Army sent me back to an EOD refresher in 1997 uh, for the purposes of participating in UNSCOM inspections in Iraq, where I was a missile and BWCW inspector. I also retired shortly thereafter and went to work for a federal government agency where I worked in their explosives program for about the next 15 years. And they sent me to a lot of training as well. Uh, so although I was not doing uh, U.S. level EOD work for a number of years. I was actually training foreign EOD teams at the basic level and also learning a lot about uh, working with foreign EOD units. And that was where I really felt like I could I could add something to the mix here because although my, my technical expertise in terms of modern EOD tools and things are not as current as, for example, my colleague Dakota, who has 12 uh, 10 very recent years as an Air Force EOD tech with, with combat tours in Syria and uh, Iraq. Um, I have something that not everybody else has, and that's a lot of experience working with foreign EOD teams on their turf, trying to get them to work together, trying to move, trying to move their, their level of expertise up. They have a very strong uh, EOD structure, but they don't have enough people. So what we're hoping to do is uh, Dakota and I and a couple of other guys that we've already linked up with. There's a Brit here uh, the, who is, who's representing FUEOD, the Friends of Ukraine FEOD. He's a Brit. 
And um, and there's another a Brit here that we're that we're trying to get in touch with today. What we're planning to do is the immediate thing we're going to do is go out and be more techs for them. Uh, but the longer term thing that we're going to do is start working pretty hard uh, with both bomb techs without borders. Uh, FU EOD has already got some people scheduled for training out in Kosovo. Uh, but because of the national martial law situation in Ukraine, no men of military age can leave Ukraine. So what they've done is recruited eight women to go to EOD school in Kosovo, which I think is a fantastic idea. But what we're going to try to do is by our goal is by the end of May to set up training here in country um, that will provide the ability for us to spin up because they're hiring more people right now into the technical department, but they're not EOD qualified. Obviously, they're guys off the street. So we're going to try to run a training course by the end of May or start running a training course by the end of May that will train a couple different categories of people. One will be just sort of basic. Hey, I know what this is and I know not to step on it. Let's put a flag there. Uh, and then a second group will be training to IMAS, IMAS level one and IMAS level two standards, which are EOD techs. And then the third level is training EOD supervisors, taking existing techs and running them through a one or two week course to give them the skills they need to lead and plan EOD operations. Um, so that will allow them to expand rapidly once they have some more personnel. Um, so that's our goal. Uh, obviously, in order to achieve that goal, we need funding. Uh, we, we are both um, Dakota and I and the British guy that I mentioned, we're all here on our own dime. I sold a car so that I could afford the plane ticket to fly over here. And um, so my wife is, uh, is raising money and my son is raising money and BTWAB headquarters is raising money. And uh, uh, we are hoping that we might be able to get, you know, like a State Department contract to assist us. Uh, we're not in it for the money, neither is BTWAB. It's a nonprofit. It's a, it's a listed NGO, 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, all we're looking is for the tools, and, and literally there are tools needed too, in addition to, um, in addition to, the, uh, to the manpower needs, uh, they need tools. You know, they're using up their supply of various things pretty rapidly, destroying, because some of the ordnance you can't handle unless you safe it first. And in most cases, the safety process is explosive. Um, so they're using up their tools um, very rapidly to both safe the ordnance and to destroy the ordnance once it's been once it's been safed and moved to a range someplace. They still need to get rid of it. And so that's, you know, using up their supplies of explosives is using up their supplies of specialized tools. So for that, we need money. Well, you mentioned that you're there on your own dime. What is your motivating factor for being there? Why do you want to be in Ukraine and, and to assist in the way you're doing? Well, um, it's kind of twofold. I guess it's really threefold, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, number one, you know, 30 to 40, 50 years ago, um, there were lots of guys like me in the Fulda Gap ready to face the Russian invasion of Germany. And um, it never happened. And now Ukraine is taking that hit. And I really feel in, in a certain, in a way, that, that they're taking the hit that we were all expecting with all of NATO and all of our forces, we were expecting to take that hit in the Fulda Gap. And uh, it never came. And so, in a way, Ukraine's fighting our fight. And, uh, and that's one reason. Another reason is that, that this invasion of a sovereign nation, uh, which has a peaceful intent, yeah, they have their warts. You know, they've got a problem with corruption. They have some units in the armed forces that are, that are accused of being neo-Nazis and things like that. But this is not a Nazi nation. I mean, good grief, you know, the president's Jewish for crying out loud. So um, that sort of thing is ridiculous. And so to me, this is a struggle, an elemental struggle of good against evil. And the last thing, and I, I didn't go into this a lot with CNN, but um, uh, I was uh, studying in my church about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This just happened to be something we were studying. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran minister in, uh, in Germany in the 30s. And he finally came to the conclusion that he could not stand by and let the Nazis do what they were doing. And so he joined the resistance, and ultimately he and almost all of his family were executed before the end of the war. And I was watching a video of some guys dismantle a bomb by hand, and 
I suddenly had this aha moment and I said, I can add to that. I mean, I'm probably not a great asset on the infantry battlefield. You know, when you weigh me down with armor and weapons and helmet and all that other crap, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't last till I'm in pretty good shape, but for a 69 years old, I mean, let's, let's be realistic. Uh, but I can do something here. I can wear body armor for the day and I can go out and, and pick up ordnance and I can give classes and, and more importantly, I can organize stuff. That's what I'm doing right now. Other than going out with them on a daily, on a more or less daily basis to, to actually assist as a technician, I can organize things, uh, to try to support them. So that's how I can help. And I felt like I had to help. As my wife said, I felt convicted. I had to go. Well, you mentioned your wife. What does your family and friends think about you being there? Well, you know, my wife's an Air Force officer, and um, she and I um, were together in Iraq for a year, uh, deployed. Um, and uh, so she knows the deal. And she was with me uh, uh, during my last few years in Special Forces. And so she understand. and some of the contract work I did after I left the Army. Um, you know, she wasn't happy about it, but she supports me 100% and understands why I'm doing it. You know, the, the, the little tagline for the CNN article said, came over here to train Ukrainians. Well, yeah, I came over here to train Ukrainians, but not the bomb techs. They know what they're doing. I'm, I'm coming here to train Ukrainians that don't have those skills and try to bring them up to the level of my brothers in the EOD squad here. I guess and finally for you, sir. What do you want your fellow MOA members to know about what's happening in Ukraine or what your experience is there in Ukraine? Well, um, I guess the best thing I could say to them is that, uh, you know, not everybody is prepared or physically ready to come over here and offer physical support. I'm fortunate to, to feel like I had something technical to offer and that my body was still in good enough shape to come over and actually do it. Not everybody's going to feel that way. Not everybody can go. You know, guys that have jobs, women that have careers and, and children and, and all the stuff that, that ties us to our homeland. Uh, I'm not encouraging a wash of retired officers to come flying to, to Ukraine. But there are things you can do. And one of the things you can do is contribute to various uh, humanitarian organizations. I know uh, my MOA chapter, the one that my wife is president of, um, uh, had a fundraiser for the Moldova World Children's Fund just before I left to come over here. Right. So I'm just saying to my fellow officers, if you can give 10 bucks to whichever one of these charities that, that you know, you seem to think is good. If you want to send 10 bucks to BTWAB, we'll certainly take it. Um, if you prefer to donate to a humanitarian charity uh, like the Red Cross or any any wonder of number of organizations that are operating here in Ukraine supporting humanitarian efforts, uh, I encourage you to do so. Everybody can spare a dime or two. Everybody can spare ten dollars or twenty five dollars, you know, and um, and, you know, uh, ten dollars from a thousand guys. I mean, that's uh, that's ten thousand dollars that can buy that can buy a lot of a gear. It can get a couple of EOD techs on a plane over here. 